money and its advances. I'm talking about like back when it really was like the the sugar daddy of the world. How mm-hmm. you could have oh, the poorest people, the natives, people yeah. living below below third world conditions oh, on their yeah, own yeah. soil, and not and not have a hint of irony about it. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah, and and it's it's horrible because you have the 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 real knowledge of the the elders who are who are dying now. They have to live in a certain way. If you're a medicine person, you're appointed by your community. And anybody who comes to you for help, you help them, whether they can give you a chicken or they can give you um, tobacco, whether they can give you a few bucks or not, you have to help them. So there are medicine people who have this, you know, centuries of knowledge that, that's going to die with them, and, and they're, you know, they're subsisting on, you know, scraps, I mean, literal scraps, off apples that are falling off, the, you know, the orchard next door into their, you know, yard. Stuff like that is going on. It's unacceptable. Well, and Kira, have you noticed how they'll, you know, on the res, you can you, sometimes you can get ha- a house. You, mm-hmm. I know a few people in on different reses, and mm-hmm. you can get a brick home, but right. but then you get it, and, and and you have no curtains, you have no furniture, you have no, right. you know what I mean? It's just, and you have no it, way, and your awful. your heat I gets mean, turned off in the winter when it's you know, 50 yeah. below zero. People freeze to death every year on the reservation because of that, because they will shut their electricity off. And that, that's inhuman. That's a oh, psychopathically that's, that's controlled sick. structure. Just you know? business. And, well, yeah, you know, and as, from the attack on the natives, not just in America, I mean, in AD 60, Suetonius Polonus and his Roman legions crossed the Menace Straits in Wales to massacre the last of the British Druids. It's been happening right. everywhere. In India, Absolutely. when the British, when the British, the East India Company first got to India, they were overwhelmed by how India was almost a paradise compared to Europe at the time. There was no beggars, no poverty. This is what this right. was the British own own observations: a high education, a high a standard, a standard of society and culture. And the, mm-hmm. the British East India Company determined the only way we're ever going to conquer India is by teaching them English bringing them into our system, and then destroying them from within. And that's exactly mm-hmm. what happened. Right. Anywhere there's a, right. native, a native wisdom, anywhere on this planet. If, mm-hmm. that's what, if they found them on the moon, they'd be launching the spaceships out to get them, no matter what happens. Right, right. right. Because if, if there was some resource societal. under their feet. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. The resource, but the resource is only half them. They do not want a different form of consciousness on this planet that does not tie right. in with their psychopathic control hierarchy mm-hmm. model. They just don't want it. Right. Because right. indigenous well, wisdom teaches that there's always enough for everyone as long as you share. And you yes. know, yes. consciousness yes. parasites don't want to share. <laughs> that's that's their whole gig. They want it all for themselves. You know? So it, it, it doesn't have anything to do with race, though. It has to do with indigenous versus non-indigenous. And the history of the world is the history of psychopathically controlled cultures taking over indigenous cultures that are non-psychopathically controlled. That is the history of the world. And it doesn't have anything to do with race. From Mesoamerica to Asia to North America, I mean, everywhere. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think we can look at what's going on now for Native Americans, and we can extrapolate that backwards in history to, to think about what was going on for the Druids. Because I bet it was, you know, the same. The same oh, yeah. uh, challenges that they were facing then, that we face now. Well, well that's the, the, the Irish, I mean, not to, not to say that we've suffered in the same level now, but in the past, right. the same was done in Ireland by through the British Empire. I mean, I always right. maintained that potatoes and whiskies were, were whiskey were imported bioweapons that were later right. exported to the high sugar High starch, mm-hmm. high carbohydrate diet coupled with alcohol was then exported right. to the United States. And the Cromwellian mm-hmm. invasion of Ireland was the test model for what they exported to the, to the West Indies and then later to the United States. Keep Absolutely the sluggish, the test model. flabby, uh, mal- malnourished and get them drunk. Mm-hmm. Right. And now the diabetes. Yeah. And the whiskey right. was specific. Epidemic. The whiskey, the whiskey was an import. Because and whiskey they, they speeds the, up that diabetic process, too. 
Yeah, because oh, yeah. natives, natives had their own beer. They had their own made, their own alcohol that was right, brewed, right, right. brewed not in the same intense way that whiskey is. And I've no mm-hmm. doubt that whiskey was used by the by the, the psychopathic control group of the British Empire on the Scots and the Irish to get rid of them. I've no doubt about that. And they brought the same right. method everywhere. It was bio-warfare. They were slow kill bio-weapons. Oh, yes. I, and they're I, dealing with the same, the same lineage of pathology. Mm-hmm. And the thing that they yeah. uh, fear the most is us. We're, we're, we can using the Internet to all connect with each other and, and, and to share <laughs> our indigenous wisdom that we still have inside yeah, of us. Yeah, well, all. that's we're the return of the native. That's what we are. What you yeah. call this awakened movement, these people get waking up to the psychopathic control grid. It doesn't matter what spiritual tradition or atheists, what social class, what nation. We're all agreeing on this subject. We're all right. agreeing. And we're not arguing about it. And this has mm-hmm. to frighten the shit out of them. It has to be right. terrifying. We do not argue. <laughs> I, I've yet to encounter people who argue about the psychopathic issue. No matter what the issue, the, the background is, what the spiritual or atheist or anything political or social class, everyone says to me, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And the only ones who argue a bit about it would be a very, and I have to say it's extremely rare, would be some trumped up guy who wants to know why I don't have a degree in it. And he's easily dismissed very quickly because he's just trying to, right. like, he's just trying to show off his academic credentials. But it doesn't last mm-hmm. long. But this is the issue we all, and even they will begrudgingly agree on it. We are, the, we are the natives. We are the return of the new native. And the internet has right. made a part of it. And this is also why they want to shut this thing down as well and create all these kinds of cults within the internet to destroy that as well. They do not want mm-hmm. us being warriors, consciousness warriors. Mm-hmm. But uh, the cat's out of the bag now. They can, they, it's, it, we, it, we, they, they, they've, not, they've not taken enough control of us in the early days, the fact that we're, we've, got, we've got through to everyone at this point. Yep. May Iceland disease spread worldwide. I understand that's what they call uh, what Iceland did with their with their financial system, and they just put these people in prison. Every country on the planet has laws against what's going on. They're just not being enforced. So once mm-hmm. humanity goes, huh? These guys have been doing what? I'm sorry, I've been busy watching Honey Boo Boo. And right. playing with my <laughs> iPad, but right. you know, wait, what? These guys have been doing what? So once humanity awakens to this, this very small group of people can be properly addressed and put away, and then we can have an opportunity to let benevolent leadership rise up. And do what is proper, just as humans. Well, I totally agree, and it's, it, this is what I just—it's—it's it's so moving to me that when true consciousness warriors like us—and I'm not saying we're an elite caste or anything—the <laughs> fact that we're actually we're actually we're actually standing up in our own way is it, just—it it means so much because the ball is rolling towards an end that will, I, agree, I believe, in time, isolate the psychopathic biohazard from the majority of the population. And we do it one by one. And the first thing is, I mean, I'm a firm believer in the rebel heart. It doesn't matter if you work in a government job or wherever you do, or wherever you go. If you have that rebel heart inside you, that will sustain you and get you through the bullshit. And I really yeah. do believe yeah. that. That's, and that's the important yeah. one. When, when, when you, you must, instead of seeing, when people have to work in a shitty environment where psychopaths run it, instead of, mm-hmm. instead of seeing yourself, and I, you know, I know it's easy, but it got me through this bullshit. Instead of seeing mm-hmm. yourself as a victim, because that's what they want to see you as a victim, right. see, yourself as, see yourself as a resistance fighter. Mm-hmm. A resistance Info- fighter. Yeah. An infiltrator, a resistance fighter of consciousness. And that can yeah. be so empowering. Because but then you're saying, I'm on to you. And they, they know this. They feel this. But they, because they can't put their finger on it, because you've got the smile on your face, but you still got the rebel heart on you, <laughs> it pisses them off mm. because they don't know how to oh, deal yeah. with you. And you own them. Yeah, and I, you own them and, go on. I can talk to anyone. So I can talk to anyone from the, the boss all the way to you know the, the people <laughs> who are on the phone. 
I can talk to anyone and I can talk to them about anything. And um, that's the thing that they can't do because they have only one one mode of of uh, interacting, and that is it's a power mode. They they can't relate to people. They don't have a way to nurture relationships, or you know. And and we have that too. And we have humor. That's the other thing that we have is we yeah. have humor. And creativity. And, right. And every time some stupid thing comes down the pike where they're, you know, they're out, oh, they're at it again. We just, we just laugh about it. We laugh at them. And, you know. Very they, important. But, yeah. But they will but try our, to. That's our counter propaganda. Right. Exactly. Uh, parody and we are too many moving targets to be mm-hmm. effectively eliminated. Yep. Mm-hmm. They'll try to feed us GMOs and they'll try to starve us with, you know, gro- our, like our grocery prices. It goes up every time I go to the grocery store. It's getting almost impossible to afford right. you know, nutritious food. Um, they'll, they'll do everything they can to sort of weaken us, you know, weaken our immune systems with the, the GMO and the, uh, and the uh, gluten. You know, that's what crippled me. I mean, literally crippled me. Uh, um, made me into a cripple. But uh, you know they'll 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 try those things, but still, um, our our will is strong. You know, yeah, I, I strong. And, yeah. The the woman who targeted me at work, I mean, it almost killed me. But I kept going back every day. I kept going back, and I kept. I just I knew I would somehow survive because I had to. I had to. Well, you know, <laughs> good old Frederick Nietzsche was right. What doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. I think in exactly. terms of the psychopath, that's the best. That is, that's a great mantra to think because it, mm-hmm. they, they, as long as we don't play into the traps and we continue to undermine them, we, we can win. Right. We can win and they, they, are, they are doomed. So listen, yeah, guys. Every no breath that we take gets yeah. us closer to our goal. Yeah, yeah, and we go on regardless. We we do we do not have to disrupt us. Like I said, and the moment it, I discovered, it, the moment I discovered that if I could keep myself emotionally flat and not respond to any of the um, the attempts at triggering my my stuff, uh, that was yeah. like the biggest victory for me because she she couldn't pull my energy away from me anymore because I knew oh, it, was, it was all a, a trap. Yeah, that's a so. big one. So that's a guess why I want every everybody needs to check out Kira's Psychopaths in Charge blog. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. It's common sense, straightforward stuff. It's the kind of uh, counterinsurgency measures we all need to take. And Swami, what night is your radio show on Fridays? Is it uh, Friday afternoons in America? But we get most of our listens through the archive. So anyone who taps into the archive and cares about practices of meditation and the Eastern perspective on how to live your life and live up to your full potential despite anything going on around you, I would invite you to uh, check us out. So there you go, folks. Keep your rebel heart beating. And now we're going to the next song, ironically called Miracle by Tripper Cubicle. Thanks, guys. (laughs) Thank you.
And that was Miracle by Tripper Cubicle. This is the second hour of the Velocity of Now here on the Type 1 Radio Network with Steve on the controls tonight. My name is Tommy Sheridan, and welcome again to the final rundown of the show. Well, the final stretch, we'll say, better use of language. Tommy Sheridan, arts.com, and uh, get in there, read the articles, and share them if you can, because we, the Warriors have a duty to do now is the time to stand up and you don't have to do it out of being guilted into doing it or being forced to do it you just do it you don't need a central commander giving you the orders to do it you do it yourself because you keep that rebel heart beating inside you i'm going to get kira back on in a couple of weeks from psychopaths in charge website i want to do a do an hour or so talking about female psychopaths as far as i know i'm the only one out there who who brings up the female psychopath issue. And uh, it's a big no-no, mainly because, uh, unfortunately, I've now come to consider that many of these recovery groups that deal with psychopath recovery, I think if some of the women on them are not full-blown female psychopaths who are playing a sympathy card and pity game and smear camping and game, they're high-level protos. And I want to deal with this issue. I don't care. You can call me sexist. The reason why I bring this issue up is not because I'm a man. It's because the majority of the stories, the vast majority of stories I get sent to me regarding female psycho- psychopathy and the damages it causes is given to me by women. Women have had to deal with female psychopaths on the job particularly, but also in other aspects of life, friendships and stuff like that. Or they would reveal themselves while planning for a wedding and things like that. And so we're going to talk about that. And I'll bring Kira on about that because it's, it, I want, it's not fair that me, a man alone, is just talking about this. Because that would make me no better than these, these recovery sites where all women are just talking about male psychopaths and every, women and homosexuals. And everything is exclusive. And I'm putting down gays and I'm putting down women, so relax. But it's like that's what, that's what I found on some of these groups there. They're either extreme codependents or they're protos or they're full blowns pretending to be victims, learning about it. So it would make me know better than that. So I want to have a woman on with me talking with this and, and Kira from Psychopaths in Charge. I'll have her back on in a few weeks. Now, then the second part of the hour, I want to talk a little bit more about some news stories. And in the context of, I began the show talking about I was visiting an SSS, an SS bunker in Norway. And there's a video of that on my YouTube channel. The reason for this is I'm trying to understand the mindset of what led to these policies in the me- for the main reason that it's happening again, folks. The Nazis never lost. The Nazis, they never, ever lost. What they did was they changed tactics. The German people lost, but the Nazis won. And the proof of that would be everywhere. You just look at the Bush family in America, Prescott Bush, as Gore, Gore Vidal used to call him, the insidious senator from Connecticut, a Nazi war profiteer. And his family, all the same, all continuing down from the, uh, the Nazi policies right into the present. We have to come to terms with this. We're dealing with many of the same policies, but they're not done in the same way. They're not done as overtly or full on. And I'm going to read this story and talk about a few issues that will bring this to light. Now, there's a story in the UK independent paper, not the Irish independent, the UK independent paper. It doesn't matter, both owned by Tony O'Reilly, the, the same character. And the story is from the day, Sunday, the 19th of January, 2004. And the title of the article is, Let Disabled Workers Build the 42 billion pound high-speed rail network too. They're planning and they're building a new high-speed rail network in, in the UK, similar to the ones that have already been built in France, Germany, and Japan. And the article is by a guy called, funny enough, Mark Lefty. I was pretty funny. And uh, the, I'll read the article to you, and in my usual style, I'll comment on what's really happening in the context of what I've been talking about. The physically disabled, the unemployable, and the former prisoners should build a 42 billion, 42.6 billion high-speed railway, according to a powerful new industry lobbying group, 
Jim Steer, chief executive of the, at the High Speed Rail Industry Leaders Group, said that HS, HS2 chairman, Sir David Higgins, they're always a knight, aren't they? They're always royal. They've all got the, the royal decree. Sir David Higgins should learn from France, which used nearly 1,000 disadvantaged people to build the Ryan Rowan line. The High Speed Railway opened in late 2011, cutting the journey from Paris to Zurich by 30 minutes, a similar amount of time that the HS2 would carve off the commute from London to Birmingham. Now, I'm going to stop here and talk about that 1,000 people that were used to build the, Ro- the Ryan Rowan line in France. This is a misleading statement, of course, by this character, Jim, Jim Steer. What they did in France, I checked it up, was the line was built through rural areas with high unemployment, and they gave jobs on the, re- on the network to local people paying them the same salary as what employees of the company and SNCF, the French rail company, were paying them. It was, it was, it was not forced. It was voluntary. And it was, there were people were offered the jobs in the rural area. It was a chance to make a lot of cash in a, quick, in a, in a couple of years. And people, quite rightly, when you gave them the opportunity, jumped on it. That's not the same thing as this guy Jim Steer is implying, that they were somehow seized at the dole offices are pulled out of the dis- disabled rehabilitation centres and thrown uh, with a pick and axe onto the, tr- onto the rail line and started to dig it. It's nothing like that at all. They also gave jobs in France to people who had disabilities, such as Down syndrome. And it was, it was actually quite a nice programme that they had there to make them feel like they were part of this project for the community. Very different than what this bastard is implying. I'll continue with the article. Mr. Steer said, in building the HS2, we've got to look at a better all-round policy, not just economic, but socially as well. Like, corporations really care about social, so, social issues. A good precedent for this is the Rhine Rhone Rhine line, built and completed in France, where 12% of the workforce was expressly recruited from a disadvantaged group. He forgot to add voluntary. These included the previously unemployed, the so-called unemployable, and the physically disadvantaged people with some kind of criminal record. There is more than enough time to start the schedule for the laying of the HS2 tracks in 2017 to ensure that there are wider social benefits from the construction phase of the project. You sneaky, devious bastard. What this guy is looking for is for free labor. He's looking for free workers. He's not looking for any kind of social benefit. He's looking for exactly the same thing as, this, as the concentration camp workers got in IG Farben at Auschwitz, building the, making the c- cement for the Atlantic Wall. Free labor to cut down costs. It has nothing to do with a social mandate. It's purely a way of building the rail line for cutting as much cost as possible so bastards like him can get bigger bigger paychecks and bigger uh, bonuses because that's how the rail line will be actually time scaled if they achieve certain certain uh, target dates and target objectives within the project time frame they continue to get social funding and also corporations will give their bosses bigger bonuses a good way to do that is to have slave labor this is how devious these scumbags are. This is, this is proof that the Nazis never went away. This is IG Farben at Auschwitz again. The same mentality. And I'm sure if you went to IG Farben at the time, and they, they, they probably said the same thing about the concentration camps and the labor camps. It's a good social benefit. Mr. Stewart's words carry weight as his organization is backed by some of the biggest rail engineers and operators in international transport. They include the U.S. giant Bechtel, weapons manufacturer, Germany's Siemens, Keolis from France, and the London Stock Exchange listed group W.S. Watkins, while Alstrom, French military manufacturer, Bombardier, same thing again, and Hitachi, they they built fighters for the Japanese World War II, are thought to be, and also are heavily involved in the, I think it was called the 700 group. Uh, the, the Japanese live experiments on people during World War II are thought to be close to joining the membership list. You see, you see how it all works? It's just like Mussolini said. 
Fascism is corporatism, corporations running a country. Mr. Steer was once a senior figure at the Strategic Rail Authority, and his comments come at an opportune moment given the bizarre diplomatic row that blew up between France and the UK last week. Responding to an article in the City of London AM financial newspaper that criticised France for a general hatred of commerce, translation, the French government tend to put their, the welfare of their population on an equal footing as looking after their corp- corporations, which in the mind of the psychopaths of the, London, the city of London means that they hate commerce. The French embassy, Lambasse, that's one of the reasons the French are hated by the Americans, did you know that? Because of their successful social policies. That's one of the reasons that the French have actually found a unique balance between, uh, I'm not saying France is a paradise or anything like that, but between social and, and commercial policies. They've actually found a pretty good balance that, that works for their French. And they don't want the rest of the world knowing that. That's why the Americans call them cheese-eating surrender monkeys for doing the right thing and not getting involved in a disgusting war for oil. But anyway, that comes from the same crowd. The French embassy lambasted the quality of the NHS of the National Health Service in England. Uh, that's true. This in turn resulted in an angry rebuttal by Gen- Jeremy Hunt, the health secretary. You see, this is all bullshit. Now, the focus on skilled also comes after HS2 announced the creation of a £20 million college to train a generation of world-class engineers. There have been fears in the UK that the UK does not have enough top-drawer engineers to build a vast new railway that could eventually link the capital to Scotland. Now, listen to this: what this says. The UK does not have enough top-class engineers. This is the land of Stevenson, or sorry, this is the land of Brunel. This is the land that produced the greatest engineers of all. They don't have them today. You know why they don't have them today? Because the same kind of characters like this guy Steer in the past downsized UK's heavy industry by moving it all to the Far East. That's why they don't exist. There's no need for heavy engineers because the engineers aren't needed because the jobs were all money-changing jobs in the Bank of England and in the City of London and Stock Exchange, all that crap. That's why it happened. But they don't tell you that. Instead, they're going to train new elite engineers because all the skill sets have been lost because of the destruction of British industry and they're coping it with, you know, slave labor. HS2 has been heavily criticized for its spiraling costs. The budget was increased by $10 billion last year, and the potential environmental damage, including allegations of thousands of acres of ancient woodland, will be destroyed to make way for the lion. The project is currently going through Parliament, with ministers hoping that a bill approving the HS2's construction can be voted in on the statute books before, the end, before next year's general election. Campaigners imposing the project have until the 10th of February to respond to HS2's environmental statement after a deadline for next Friday was extended. This was because 877 pages of documents related to the environmental assessment have yet to have been left off the memory stick. Very interesting. On Friday, and see, although railways and commuter trains are very good for the environment, that's actually true, but... What people don't know also is high-speed rail networks require, because they run on electricity, they actually require vast amounts of power. This is what this this is how they. It's actually been shown that the high-speed rail networks are really not very good in terms of power consumption. They're very poor, and you know what? The only countries that really have them are countries that have nuclear power. France is a very heavily nuclear nuclear power operated country. So is. Um, Japan. What are they building in the UK? Well, they're building new power plants. That's these power plants are to fund this high-speed rail network. And that's why, this is why you have to be careful with all these one-off solutions, because everything is related to everything else. It's a chain reaction. It's, it's always like that. But anyway, this guy here wants to build a rail line using slave, essentially slave labor. Slave labor called from people who are unemployed. Now, I'm going to talk a bit more of this after the next song. The next song is entitled Shakespeare Part 2, the name of the band, and the song is called Everyone, Everything Everyone Just Said. 
And after the song, I'm going to talk about the social issues behind that and the incredible propaganda that's been used to actually demonize people who are poor. So you can let the song go now. Thank you very much, Steve. Shakespeare Part 2, everything everyone just said. The final stretch on the Type 1 underground broadcasting revolutionary network, an incredibly inclusive station that doesn't have a donate button as big as Russell Brand's dick. We are an independent station getting every voice out there and every kind of people you can imagine are on this network because that's what it's going to take. As the, the old song that was written by Andy Fraser from Free and was a make great version was done by the late, the late Robert Palmer, God rest his soul. It takes every kind of people. And that's what the Type 1 Network is about, and that's what I'm about, and that's what we're all about. And we're, we're, It's taking people, decent souls, to stand up for decency. Now back to the subject of slave labor being used to do government so-called public projects that are really just what they call pro- public-private partnership projects, which means that the taxpayers spend money on the construction of these projects and then they hand it for free to corporations. The high-speed two-rail network in the UK, the suggestion has been now made that people will be taken off unemployment, disability, and made to work as slave labor because we're back. The Nazis never lost. They just changed their public relations. Ultimately, the same motherfuckers are around running the show. Now, a big part of doing this is to demonize. Before World War II happened, you had films being made which demonized minorities, which demonized the, the handicapped. For two reasons. One, to exterminate them, and it was done under the thing of pity, a social project. Let's kill the disabled. Let's kill the, 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 the people who are handicapped. Relieve these souls from their torture. And it was sold, the eugenics thing, and it was sold that way. This was all done prior to the implementation of this. Same thing with minorities in Europe, not just the Jews, but everyone, the Poles, the Russians, the Czechs. All these people were all portrayed as inferior to human beings, and therefore that made the process easier. You think that doesn't go on? Well, there was a program this week, and I've been running this so far, on Channel 4 Network in the UK, a network that used to actually make, well, one time used to actually make quite good documentaries, called Benefit Street. This is the same thing. It's demonizing poor people or people with problems in order to exterminate them or to use them for corporate slavery. That's all it exists for. The same network that Christopher Dutton was given an open mic to tell us how wonderful psychopaths running the show are and how we should all embrace our inner psychopath, which apparently doesn't include embracing your inner Jimmy Savile. He didn't give that example. Now, this show Benefits, this show Benefit Street takes place in Birmingham. Again, Birmingham in England, which is the second largest city in the UK. It's on a street called uh, James Turner Street. Birmingham, once the centre of British manufacturing, all the manufacturing, of course, has been closed down or moved. It was a centre of UK auto production. I think Rover were there. That's, that was, they had an enormous plant. And it was also very heavily involved in all kinds of machine tooling and everything else. The city has been transformed. And, of course, you have the fallout of that. You have intergenerational welfare in some poorer districts of the city. It's a city I know quite well. Even though it's, it's a quite an ugly place, it's not an attractive city. I have family connections there. I've been there a few times. And I actually always feel at home in Birmingham, even though it's like, it's like the ugly dog you can't help but love. That's, that's how I would describe the city. I actually think it's a, a lot of... It's still, it doesn't have anything going for it, really, in terms of being exciting. It gave the world heavy metal. It gave, us, it gave Judas Priest and uh, Black Sabbath. And I think Duran Duran came there, too. But other than that, it, it, it's just one of those places that... What makes it stand out is the people are, so, are just so nice, even though they have a funny accent. But that's, that's, that's... I actually I quite always feel at home in Birmingham because the people tend to be quite nice there, salt of the air types. And, of course, they... This documentary, made by its usual sort of public school tops, 
portray these people as almost like a disease that has to be managed, a disease that must be dealt with. It was so bad that even even people like Paul O'Grady, who's actually a, a, a guy from Liverpool as a, a drag act, well, actually a pretty a pretty excellent entertainer, a brilliant stand-up comedian in his female uh, persona as Lily Savage in his gigantic wigs, big fan of his comedy, and a, a really, you know, one of the few celebrities out there that when he opens his mouth to talk about things, unlike Russell Brand, it's something that's worth hearing. Because the guy is obviously a very intelligent man, comes from a working class Liverpoolian background, knows exactly what he's talking about, and he's also genuinely talented. He's actually quite brilliant. Now, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Paul O'Grady, and I was delighted when he came out, and he just said that that's basically what they were doing. They were dehumanizing people on public assistance, on welfare, on benefits, in order to portray them as a disease. Now, the only difference between them, those people on Benefit Street in Birmingham, and the people who commission, produce, and go, sit there watching the program going, tut, 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 is an accident of birth. The ones who get to be producers at Channel 4 were lucky to be born into the right social status, where they could go to Eton and Harrow and then to Cambridge and become producers. The ones on Benefit Street were unfortunate in that sense, and that they were born into a working class situation. Now, I know, look, I'm from the ghetto, okay? I'm from that background, okay? So I can speak with, unlike a Guardian reader or a member of the Socialist Workers' Party, I can speak with some authority on these matters. Yes, there are people in the neighborhood I grew up, just like the, the Benefit Street neighborhood, who are, would be low level psychopaths who would be milking the system, who have no desire to do anything other than get sex from the locals, score drugs, get drunk, get beer. Then there's, that, that, but they're a tiny minority. They're still the 4%, okay? Then you get the other people who have addictions problems. They drink, you know, they drink, a, they drink too much. One of the problems, reason for that is alcohol through these convenience stores like Lidl and Aldi and, and everywhere else has become very affordable that even if you're on minimum benefits, you can still get a lot of alcohol. And that's, 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 that exists too, but again, they're a minority. The majority of people in these neighborhoods would be decent people who would want to do the best thing by their families. But of course, the cameras don't go in there. The neighborhood that I grew up in Dublin was just like that. When I was about, I don't know, I was about 14, not as old as I was, 14 or 15, a TV camera crew came in to do a social study for some, you know, the usual sort of like pandering, patronizing TV magazine program going, tut, 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 life in the ghetto is hard. And uh, I can rem what happened was the camera crew was there, and, you know, being a, a typical sort of ghetto kid that I was, and my friends were, you see a TV camera crew, you, think, you just want a piece of the action. You never see TV camera crews in the, in, in the town. So we went over... And, you know, we start talking to the guy. And, and there was like a sound guy with a big mic with the, the spongy thing on it. Looked like a big, that was, that was funny. That was like, it looked like a big, like, tribble from Star Trek. And then there was uh, the camera guy. And there was like a guy with a, a woman with a, uh, a sort of a, a portfolio, a document. And she was reading that to another guy who, who was like the, the host of the show. And uh, the guy came over to us and he says, Lads, do you want to get on television? And you know, you're laughing. And you say, oh, definitely, yeah. And he goes, what, will you go over there by the shopping center entrance and make it look like you're selling drugs or buying drugs? Now, one of my friends was a junkie, but he wasn't there that day. Uh, the rest of them, we never took drugs. I, I never even drank until I, regularly. I mean, I had alcohol when I was in my late teens and... And then I stopped drinking until I was nearly, oh, after tour, I didn't start drinking again. And I never took drugs. I never smoked cigarettes. I was actually quite surprising. And, so, and all, all my friends were too. It, I don't know what that came from. Maybe it was an inherent sort of like re rejection of that stuff. But uh, I didn't know what buying drugs was like. But stupidly being a stupid teenager, I went over there and did it. And they blacked out our faces and everything. We, we were having a laugh. We were make, as much making fun of the of the TV producers as we were, and we were laughing at them and everything. 
what years later when time passed I, I look back on it and says what I was basically doing was running propaganda against my own neighborhood I was unwillingly taking part in that I was a stupid teenager I didn't know any better but that's what they do they seek out the the worst and the most negative elements within these impoverished neighborhoods but they never show you the kid who's, you know, going to karate or martial art class, you know, four nights a week and training really hard so he or she can win some kind of black belt, a major competition, and then from that jump out into a better life in society. They don't show you the kids who are practicing music. They don't show you the kids who are actually studying at home, getting all kinds of tests and degrees so they can win scholarships at the top colleges and universities, which happens a lot more than you realize. They don't show you the women who work four or five jobs to keep their kids, uh, you know, clean, safe, and respectable. They work four or five jobs. I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. I knew women who had like four or five kids who worked two or three jobs, you know, part-time jobs. They'd work in a chip shop. Then they'd work in a a local factory for a a, a part-time shift. And then they would do some other kind of work. And on top of that, on top of that, take care of the kids. And back then... There was, a lot, there, was, there was a lot less consumer products available. So they have to cook food from scratch, bake from scratch. They never show that. No, they never show all, And I and, and guarantee you on Benefit Street, there's far more in Birmingham, uh, James, what's it called, James Turner Street. There's far more families like that than there's the ones they show. But we're dealing with propaganda. We're dealing with a mandate to demonize, vilify, and portray people on unemployment and disability as being subhuman. They did it in the past with gays. They did it in the past with uh, handicapped people. They did it in the past with everything. Anyone. You name it. Anyone who was ever a pain in the ass or a potential free resource of labor, the psychopathic control grid in any country, in any society, would portray them this way to get them out of the way or to co-opt them. And in the case of England, what's happening and in Scotland, I mean, I saw a thing this week. There are 10,000 unemployed, uh, 10,000 homeless people in the city of Glasgow in Scotland. Just let that sink in. 10,000 homeless people in one city. Again, Glasgow was once the centre of ship manufacturing. All the shipyards are closed and they're all in Korea and, and the Far East. No more jobs at, This repeats everywhere. Take away the native industry to increase profits. Put the local population on welfare. Eventually demonize them and come in with some big public projects and try and get them to work for free or get them out of the way if they want the land to build an Olympic stadium or something like that. And you can see it. You can always see how it processes. And I'm seeing the same thing in Ireland too. In Ireland, it's different. In Ireland... They're getting young people under the age of 30 who are unemployed to emigrate. So there's lots of programs that are on the TV and on the radio and in the newspaper saying there's no future for any young person in Ireland. Sure there is, but they completely, there, there's, there's lots of, there's, there's a great future for anyone who wants it. What you do is you do your own thing. You don't depend on the government or some corporation to give you a job. But they don't tell you that. They don't, they don't, they don't unleash your potential. They, they, they don't, un- they say to you, well, screw the corporations and government. Do your own thing. What they do is they tell you, oh, it's really bad. There's loads. And then there'll be all these programs on Irish television showing like Australian girls in bikinis surfing on Bondi Beach. And they'll be talking about there's a new visa program for Irish people to go to, Irish young people to go there. And of course, that will happen. And that's how, they, that's how, we've, that's how they've always dealt with in Ireland. And in England, what they're doing is they're doing it a different way, but it's the same agenda. There's people who are a problem. And they have to be dealt with. The ones who can actually do work will be forced into workfare. Workfare, again, was a Nazi invention. That's what the brown shirts were. The original SA were a workfare program. During the Weimar Republic, right up until the time when Hitler was elected chancellor, not elected, but was given the job by Hindenburg, as chancellor in 1933, the brown shirts were recruited mainly from people, men, but also women who were made unemployed following the catastrophe that was the Weimar Republic. Now, having said that, the Weimar Republic was portrayed as a horror gone wrong. But in other ways, it gave a lot more freedom to Germans than what came later. 
there was a lot more, there was, there was tremendous growth in the arts and so on without the control of the state. Now, the Weimar Republic had to struggle to survive between nationalist on one side and communist on the other, which led to the Bavarian uprising when they tried to, well, it wasn't an uprising, it was the Bavarian Soviet. It was similar to the situation that I was talking about earlier on with Norway. They were trying to get the Soviets to invade. Or at least, and they did, they, were, they didn't actually invade army-wise, they sent in agents, uh, fifth colonists. That's what Rosa Luxemburg was. Now, that, 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 was, that was a disaster, that Soviet, the Bavarian Soviet was a, a disaster, and they shot thousands and thousands of communists. But still, Germany was a mess. So there was lots of unemployed people, mostly men. A lot of them would have been things like returned merchant seamen and so on. And then it was the, the general level of poverty caused by the, the conditions of the, the, the Versailles Treaty at the end of World War I, which was absolutely designed to try and whip up a dictatorship in Germany. You could not have invented a document or come up with a proposal more designed to encourage uh, radicalization of the Germans than the, the Versailles Treaty when they were unfairly punished for, the, for what happened in World War I, when all, all the imperial powers were equally responsible. So the brown shirts were the first workfare program. What happened was they were given, there was an unemployment labor exchange system in Germany, in most of the states. And you would go down if you're unemployed and you got a small amount so you could buy a bit to eat and so on. But it wasn't enough to live on. And you're at the labor exchange, you would wait to see if any jobs came through. The brown shirts used to go down there and they would say to them, now it's still never been fully understood where Hitler got his money for this. I think he actually got it from international bankers. I'm still researching that one. But the money, you were, if you joined the brown shirts, you were given simple things, like you were given a supplement on top of your labor exchange allowance. That made a huge difference because then instead of living on bread, you could live on sausages or vegetables and have a better diet. You could also, if you joined the brown shirts, you were given a uniform. Now, that may seem like bullshit, but at the time, clothes were very, very expensive. Clothes were not cheap. So a brown shirt uniform was better in winter with its new thick boots than, than hobbling around half naked in the freezing cold because you couldn't afford new clothes, new clothes on the unemployment benefit. And also the, the SA, the brown shirts, ran a series of you know, restaurants and cafes that you would go in there and get a decent meal if you were a brown shirt. And you would, they, would, they had pubs and, and so on where you could get a beer. So you wouldn't be feeling depressed. If you were having a bad time, you could go and meet other men in a similar situation, drink some beer, play cards, and that kind of socializing thing. On the surface, it seemed harmless enough, but what was happened was they were building a psychopathic army. It was basically what a cult, what a cult situation was. But that was a workfare program, taking advantage of people who were desperate, but before that, they had to be vilified. And that's what was happening with this Benefit Street thing in England. Now, what happened in Germany to get them out of the, 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 what, out of the poverty and the conditions was a rearmaments pro program. And you say to yourself, well, we don't have a rearmaments prog program in Britain and Ireland today. Sure you do. Sure you do. You know who they're rearming? They're rearming the banks. The rearmaments program of the day is the banks. What did Thomas Jefferson say about banks? That a central bank and banks that are allowed to use the credit system are more powerful and dangerous than a standing army. The banks have superseded the, the, the military in the same way that within the military, the drones have superseded the cavalry. The cavalry. It's, the same, it's the same pathological devolutionary process. The armies, the banks are being rearmed with bailouts from the government, with cash injections. Everyone else is suffering. So NatWest, Bank of Ireland, uh, Anglo-Irish uh, Irish banks, and all the rest of them, and all insurance companies are all being uh, re refinanced because it's the same thing as an armaments program. For, because what that will result in will be a blitzkrieg of, once again, of cheap credit on the middle classes to keep the next generation as equally impoverished as the first, and also to ensure the ones at the bottom never ever get to the top because they'll never be able to get that cheap credit in any significant way than the, 
that beyond putting them into permanent debt, giving them credit cards and debit cards and things like that, but not serious loans to start up businesses. That, again, is no different than the racial laws in Germany during the Nazis, where certain people were not allowed to get business loans or because of they were a member of a certain group or because they were just they just they just annoyed the system. It's the same bloody thing. They just change. The psychopaths never change. You see, we're dealing with a pathological mandate that never, ever changes. But what they do change is the terms of reference. That's what they change. So instead of getting forced labor camps, you get workfare. Instead of having racial hygiene, you have something must be done about the poor and people on benefits. Yet, do you ever see, do you ever see the same, the same rationale used for the banks, the biggest welfare recipients of them all? No, because that is a rearmament process. Get the banks up and running so they can go on a blitzkrieg of cheap credit. Pouring money into big corporations that can build high-speed rail lines using slave labor who've been vilified on TV shows like Benefit Street. It's just business. The world never changes as long as psychopaths are running the show. All that changes is the thin layer of bullshit that they use to hide their plans. And every day, more and more people are seeing that layer of bullshit for what it is. And they're starting to stand up and point to it and say, that's a layer of bullshit on top of the same old crap. It's not working for them anymore. It just isn't. They're not getting away with things as well as they could. I mean, when people, you know, I look at what Chris, uh, Professor Kevin Dutton had to do and the rest of them on that Channel 4 thing, and by God, was that a compliment to the rest of us who were pointing out the, the psychopathic issue because we rattled the bisto out of them. We rattled the bisto out of them to the point where they had to do damage control. For the first time in history, because we have the internet, and because we're allowing ourselves to rise up without a manifesto and without a, a framework document, a constitution, we're rising up and we're not, being, we're not being divided and conquered against each other anymore. Those of us who can see it for what it is know that the problem is one thing and one thing only, and that's the psychopaths. The psychopaths come in all races, all social classes, all, all genders. They're gay, they're straight, they're, they're abstinent, they're all religions, and we're seeing through them. And this is terrifying for them because they cannot divide us up anymore because we are rebel hearts running free as independent consciousness warriors, insurgents. The game is up. The game is over. The cat is out of the bag and it's not going back in. And shows like Benefit Street are so easily demolished now that even people within the media like Paul O'Grady are standing up and saying, calling bullshit for what it is because that's what it is. Thank you to Kira from Psychopaths in Charge, Swami, Steve from Manning the Controls again, Nick, in the background there for feeding me some information. This is Thomas Sheridan on the Velocity of Now, the Type 1 radio network. And remember, hold your heart inside you. Know that you're not one of them. Know that you're undermining them. Have a smile on your face and fuck them if they can't take a joke. Good night and I'll see you next week. <laughs>